So, good morning, everybody. So, we are here to talk about not exactly the supply chain. <laughs> so, you, you will not understand today <laughs> Ethiopian supply chain. We are here to talk about one uh, agro system, um, what agro system are uh, present in Ethiopia. Uh, and coming to the topic uh, of this morning, it's very important to know how your coffee is produced, to know if it is sustainable, and uh, it's a big part of the transparency to understand the, the agro system. So, oh, um, this, uh, this project, this presentation is made by, uh, it's not my, my work or Fufa's work, it's a teamwork. Uh, in uh, in Addis, we are uh, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> five people. And uh, uh, coming back to transparency topic, it's important to for you to know who we are, from where we talk, in order to understand why why I'm here today, why we are here today to explain you this. Uh, so there is uh, Fontanesh, which is our crew gather, uh, Mesfin, which is a field manager, Foo Fight it which is an uh, agronomist. He was uh, graduated from uh, Master Ely in, uh, in Italy. And Delphine, which, he, which is uh, uh, managing our brand coffee forest project. And who works on, uh, who does some research about uh, sustainability. Uh, yeah, as I told you, <laughs> nothing happened without this team. Um, so I, I wanted to start to with one uh, one thing. Uh, usually, when we talk about Ethiopian coffee, I think all of you will agree. Uh, it's the Ethiopian coffee are known for the complex cup, for the uniqueness of the flavor, uh, and usually, many all everybody uh, connect this cup to the wild uh, and. <coughs> connected to the variety. So we have more variety in Ethiopia than everywhere in the world. We have 150 variety identified, uh, certified, distributed by GMA Research Centers. And in the wild, we don't know exactly how much uh, variety do we have, but probably 1,000, 3,000. We don't know, depend on the researcher, but uh, uh, it's huge. So one remark here. Uh, we don't know how to name uh, what is in the nature, so which is very important for uh, to uh, answer, to understand. We can ask a question: Why do we breed? Uh, at the same time, we don't know all the variety. We don't know how to name uh, what is existing already. So this is very important. And then third, uh, the soil, the elevation, the, the rainfall, which is ideal for coffee. So all these points are true. And uh, the, the natural habitat for Arabia, coffee, uh, coffee Arabica uh, is the uh, Ethiopian Afro-Mountain rainforest, uh, which is, um, uh, we know uh, from researcher that the Coffee Arabica is one of the five uh, a plant community present in this forest. So the, the coffee is uh, one important uh, plant, most important plant in the system. Um, so the coffee is present uh, at, in the wild, in the transitional Afro mountain wind forest, which is in Ethiopia lowland uh, forest between 500 and 1,500. Uh, but the main present in the is in the Afro mountain rainforest, which is a bit higher, which is known as a, when we talk about Ethiopian coffee, this is Islands coffee, uh, between 1,500 and 2,600, and uh, so you have there you have the ideal uh, environment to for coffee. So, in this forest, you have 4,000 plant species which is known as a Eastern afro mountain biodiversity hotspot. You still have some, uh, you have some uh, biosphere reserve uh, classified at UNESCO in Yayu, for example, I'm sure you know, uh, which is the biggest uh, wild coffee forest in, the, in Ethiopia, in the world, of course. And, uh, but you have uh, other places in Kafa, in Anfilo, in Molaga, in Cheka, in Gunji, Betmaji, in Bali, in the, uh, in the east which has all this place, you have a huge wild coffee forest. 
But uh, so this is true. Uh, the nature is like uh, ideal for coffee. But uh, to have good cup, something is missing in between, uh, which is the, the farmers and the millers. Um, one thing very important is uh, a terroir uh, is an interaction with human practices and an environment. So it's not only an environment. So to have unique coffee, you need some uh, somebody to farm and to apply some knowledge, some experience on the farming. Um, and then there are good Ethiopian coffee because you you have innovative farmers and millers. Uh, to coming back to this, um, usually we present Ethiopian farmer like uh, close to the child who were wa who was waiting for. Uh, NGO trainer or whatever to, to learn what is the farming, what is uh, to prune, for example. We can we heard a lot. Uh, we teach to these people how to prune coffee, but do you really think these people who farm coffee for, I don't know, 500, 600, 600 years don't know uh, all coffee tree doesn't give cherry, <laughs> have a low yield? Or this is, uh, to me, it's a lack of respect. And uh, there are many reasons. So this is very important for us. Um, so now it's a uh, full fast turn. Uh, thank you everyone again. So uh, as Jack already tried to explain uh, the geospatial setup of Ethiopian uh, coffee growing areas, uh, it's a kind of uh, natural environment, but the farmers are also innovating very new ideas into the, in the, into the natural environment. So. We can consider the Ethiopian coffee uh, farming system is an innovative because there are two types of, we, we, there are three, but we, we better focus on these two types of uh, farming practice. The third one could be like wild or uh, very small amount of uh, plantation, garden coffee and semi-forest coffee. What are, what are these? Maybe if you go to the Central or Latin Americas, the, the most of them are quite plantation or large amount of plantation. But in our case, it's more about garden and forest coffee. I mean, semi-forest coffee. Of what kind? Both are both accounts are more than 85 percent of uh, the uh, Ethiopian uh, coffee uh, agricultural system. So 85 means it's, it can be even more than 90. Both are in the natural agroforestry system. Maybe, I don't know how many of you have been to Ethiopia. Can I, can I see your hand? Oh, a lot of people. Thank you, guys. So just, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to ask you just uh, to brainstorm or uh, maybe, what, what do you understand from these two pictures? From, only from those who have been to Ethiopia. What can, what can you recognize? Can we start with you, Ari? Maybe. Yeah. What can I recognize? Uh, f for you, for example, these pictures, what is it? Semi forest or garden? Uh, and, that, and that one as well. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Any, anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, both are garden coffee. <laughs> for surprise. Uh, that one is really uh, more uh, self descriptive because. We took the picture very close, and this one is uh, quite a distance. And this part is from Kochari area, while uh, that is Irgachafi. If you are, if you look at the at the, at the back of the coffee plants, there are big trees which are uh, which are either grown naturally or planted by the farmers. And those plants with broad leaves are edible in those areas. So these these are uh, typical uh, garden coffees. In this forest. And this forest, it seems forest, but it's occupied or a lot of people are, or farmers are living inside this. We see the house. You can, if, you, yeah. if you go inside, maybe those of you who have been to Ethiopia and uh, have got the chance to travel to Irgajafi or Dila or around Shidama areas, you, ca you could see a lot of people living inside this uh, forest. It seems deep, dense forest, but it's fully occupied by uh, other plantations and the coffee as well. They feed those plants and for the, the entire their family and uh, harvest and take out to the, fa the market and buy whatever they need from uh, the market. So both these pictures are uh, typical garden coffee uh, farming systems in Ethiopia. What, what does 
the garden coffee look like in, it, in Ethiopian um, environment. We, th we do have two types of canopies, uh, middle uh, trees and uh, small trees, which majority of them are planted by uh, those farmers. Very few grown uh, naturally. Coffee is intercropped by different food and the cash crops. It could be uh, different from place to place based on the weather condition and the way of life. Um, for example, you know, if you know, I don't know how many of you know cat as a stimulant leaf, uh, tune in Eastern and uh, Eastern Africa and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. The cash crops like avocado or timber uh, products from big trees. So, uh, faulty banana, uh, well, I don't know whether you know it, uh, insect cordi cordianum uh, in scientific name. So, the garden coffee could have different setups based on the nature of the environment and the way of life, the, the way of living of those people. For example, if you go to Sedama and the Gedeo area, the southeastern part of Ethiopia, mostly dominated by insects, the, the, the previous plant which brought leaves, is edible. And in the eastern part of Ethiopia, Harar, maize in the cut, that stimulant leaf is widely uh, produced together with coffee. So these garden coffees are, uh, are not planted alone, there are other vegetations, so it looks like that. Sadama, Gedeo, Harar, Walaita, and other areas could be a good example of garden coffees. The, the other part is semi-forest coffee. It's not fully dense forest, but people try to manage the canopy, reduce few trees, and plant coffees. So it can create a good uh, canopy setup. Unlike the, the previous garden coffee, we, we could have three types of uh, trees or three type of uh, shade or canopies in this uh, semi-forest. The big trees, the middle and the small one. The biggest one could, could even grow beyond 30 meters, even up to 40 and 50 meters. Those, those are, we, we, could, we could have uh, a slide on it. So those big trees are most of the time uh, commercial, of kind of commercial. People cut and use it or consume it as uh, timber production. The middle ones could be between 15 to 30 meter, and the small ones are uh, like uh, those of uh, garden coffee. And uh, maybe uh, if you remember the one of the slide which was presented by Dr. Nelson, if I don't know if last yesterday, uh, he displayed one uh, canopy structures. The the the, the forest with in, in the semi forest coffees, we could have different type of canopies, like of four type even. If you remember the top, we couldn't have actually that one, anyhow, because we want to display only the nature without copying from others. So uh, this, uh, based on the previous slide which uh, Jack tried to uh, pre uh, present or explain, in uh, the biodiversity of uh, Ethiopian Afro-Monte uh, Afro rainforest, because Ethiopia is almost uh, nine degrees above the equator, uh, so we uh, ha we do have uh, a large amount of rain in the year. So usually more than 20 species per hectare would present. And uh, this kind of uh, a typical example could be Guji in the, Guji in the valley in the southeastern part, Jimma, Kafa, Benjima, Jishaka, and Amphalo in western and the southwestern parts of uh, Ethiopia are the good examples of semi-forest uh, coffees. So look at this. Uh, this these trees, this type of trees are those growing beyond or with the height of above 30 meters and even 40. So this we call it Cararo or uh, like Cordia and, and all these could be used as uh, timber production. But what, what I, I, I love to tell you is in Ethiopia most of the time people name the place or forefathers, we don't, we don't know when, when, when the naming started. They name the place or they give a name of a place based on the, the common trees grown in that area. For example, if I take Dambi, Dambi Udo, and uh, our, our staff may know, or Belko colleagues, Dambi Udo is part of Guji area, which supplies really amazing coffee. Dambi is the name of a, a tree. I don't know really it's a scientific name uh, at this moment. And for example, Ejirsa. We, we, they call it Ejersa is olive tree. 
Aroresa is part of Sidama. Aroresa is name of Siri. So most of the time, Ethiopians used to name the place, their, the places, different places, based on common types of trees grown in, the, in those areas. So what we would love to tell you also here is, here they manage the canopy structure very well. Here is coffee trees, here coffee trees. But these old plants, like every uh, living thing, could sustain for a certain period of time and get old and may die. Then they have to replace. We are behind those a few farmers or uh, key uh, suppliers to support them technically in managing the canopy and making it more sustainable. So uh, it looks like that, this uh, typical uh, semi-forest area. And this is also in Walaga area, Sudi, Sudi, right? Yeah, yeah. Sudi Homi, we call it Sudi Homi. Homi is also a name of a tree. So most of the time, they call it based on the dominant plants grown in those areas, the typical semi-forest uh, coffee uh, plantation. So uh, these are some of uh, that uh, key notes already uh, found or um, explained by researchers. Semi-forest and the forest coffee show a reduction of up to 50%, uh, species of lianas. Lianas are uh, some of the trees or plants which cannot uh, grow up straight, like uh, the, the one we show you, which could uh, just uh, depend on the others. Uh, I don't know how could I explain it. Jack may uh, explain it better. No, the, the idea is here is to show the, um, to be transparent, because also yesterday one of the researcher from pollinization he showed a, a graph showing it is a, a way to preserve the forest, but we still have 50% of the, of the, we lose 50% of biodiversity. This is important to know. And there is an, another hypothesis, uh, coming back to that, uh, which go, uh, garden coffee is a kind of uh, uh, evolution of semi-forest system uh, under high demographic pressure. So, uh, we are not judging the farmer for this, they have to eat, and so they need to farm the land, but we want also to, sh sh to tell the truth to the people, and uh, th that's why we put this slide. And uh, it's a way, so we lose 50%, but we keep also 50%. Per percent. So it's a, w it's a way to preserve some, uh, some forest and some, uh, some trees. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, by the way, when is a uh, reduction of a species of liana, lianas, a small trees, and the shrub, they are not clearing everything in the park or in the forest. They reduce some shrubs or in the small trees and plant coffee to survive because uh, they, they are struggling to meet also the biodiversity requirements. So most of the coffee growing areas are, are reserved and the people, the government is also behind that. People are also really aware of, as Jack was explaining on the previous uh, panel discussion, it's a, it's a production passed from like four or five generations, passing from five or four generations. So even though they are not well educated, they know the value of the environment. Yeah. Honestly speaking, in some places of Ethiopia, whenever people cut big trees, they, 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 they are already perceived or convinced or told by elder people to plant, replace like through seedlings instead of uh, when, whenever they cut a single uh, big tree. So there is a kind of uh, this culture, that's why they protect coffee. Maybe you can. Thank you. So uh, then um, we, we think in, uh, in our office, the, this kind of system is very rich and uh, it's very innovative. Um, and we think it's good for uh, the specialty, specialty coffee industry. Um, the first point is uh, each plot is unique. Uh, a plot uh, composition, a plot uh, when a farmer comes inside the forest to, to plant coffees, he will try to get more light, so he will cut some trees, and he will select the one he keeps. He will select each tree for a reason. Uh, it will keep these trees to fix nitrogen. It will keep this tree to because he has some insecticide seeds to fight against pests. He will keep this tree because it has some idolic lift. During dry season, he will bring water up 
and all the trees around benefit of the, this water. Um, so, and also he will choose those trees uh, based on, uh, for example, he's a woodworker, so he will keep some trees for timber. If he's a beekeeper, he will trees, he will, he will uh, manage to get flowers all over the year. So he will keep a tree like in order to have uh, flower in June, in September, and in December. So he will have like three crops in a year. Um, and then this system is, so it's, uh, it's not like coming from the wild, it's like they use the nature to get the best. And um, so this system is good for the biodiversity, it's good for the soil fertility, and it's good for the pest and disease controls and moisture control. For all these reasons, for the example I gave you before. So, uh, for example, this tree, which is Macanisa, uh, during dry season, the, the leaves are like sweating and it drops water. So, this is a good example. This tree, Cararo, it uh, only grows in the wild. So, you cannot plant it in nursery trees. So, when you see these trees, uh, you know it's a wild tree and it's a semi forest system. And without this system, this tree would have probably disappeared because you cannot uh, put it in nursery trees. And the wood is a very strong, it resists to the termite, and uh, so, yeah, you can... Uh, um, again, the idea... <coughs> uh, I put this, uh, this sentence because I wanted to somebody to tell for me. <laughs> the idea is to use the quality of the semi-forest the fertile, the fertile soil, the all the da, the the data is ideal for coffee growing, pH, uh, soil organic matters, CN ratio are ideal for coffee. Then we know uh, all the, if you have this all parameters, you know you will farm good coffees. So your cup is good, start not only for this reason but because of these reasons. Uh, uh, and then, how can we make this uh, system uh, sustainable and uh, profitable for the, all the supply chain? So I put this number. Uh, I could have put a graph and showing a lot of uh, yield data and everything, but this is which is common, com commonly accepted. Uh, we, s we see uh, a difference of, uh, of yield. First of all, you have to choose when you are a farmer uh, between yield and quality. There is a point where you go, if you go too high, you will decrease the quality, and if you go too low, you will improve it. Uh, secondly, a yield is not only uh, just a remark. It is not, go it's not happening by, uh, because of the lack of knowledge of the farmer. It could be a result of a choice. Uh, for example, I don't want, I have a limited um, capacity regarding the finance. So I'm not going to replant my plot because I have to put my money on my TEF plot, on my, uh, on my uh, cattle, uh, livestock, everything. So it's a choice from the farmer based on the, on the capacity regarding the finance, regarding the manpower. Uh, I cannot put all my work in this because I have to farm, I have to plow there and then to, in order to get some food. So the yield is not only the result of the uh, knowledge or the uh, uh, capacity you have, it is, a, it's, it, it is connected to a choice and to, to a system of culture which is a polyculture. So, yeah. So, and then, um, yeah, this is the, the reason. But can you? Uh, so, how can we make uh, so we have a low lower yield? We have uh, so how can we make it profitable from the farmer? So this is a this is a, a big question, and also connected to transparency. Uh, when once you know uh, this system, you know is uh, the parameters everything. You, you, you cannot have the same price than, um, uh, I don't know, Brazilian price, a farm and everything. So a farmer doesn't mean any, anything. Uh, when, you, when we talk about farmer, we need to know what kind of farmer is it. Is it a small brother in Africa? Is it a bigger finca in South America? 
Is it uh, so? We need to make some categories. We need to identify precisely who are we talking about. And then these people, of course, when they are smaller, the the problem is the access to specialty market. Uh, they know, for example, Ethiopia is a good example. People they drink coffee every day. They love coffee. They drink 50% of their production. So basically, they know what is good coffee. Uh, they know how to dry properly, how to pick. But if they don't have access to the market, if they don't know somebody is willing to pay more for a good picking, uh, with, for good quality, for the, they will not do it. Uh, they will do it for themselves, actually, for home, <laughs> and they will sell all the rest. Uh, can, you, can you get back? Sorry. And then the specialty supply chain needs to be aware about all this specificity and understand why do we have this cup in order to put a price in front of it and then to, of course, have a more expensive price than a mechanized farm and a big thinker. Um, a cup has always a meaning and has always a story and man behind. This is very important. And uh, there is a necessity, uh, the third point, to promote uh, this, uh, to talk about this uh, context, the agro system, and uh, about who we, what kind of farmer we have. Uh, just to add a few points on especially why they protect the environment or the, uh, the big trees. Jack already said they know actually because they feed themselves from uh, different vegetations or plants within the forest. There are some other plants which, which will be used as medicinal and and also animals living in the environment or in the forest can feed and can feed from fruits of the coffee, fruits of different plants, different trees. And there are also indigenous trees which uh, bear really delicious fruits even for, uh, for, for us, for humans. So they, they purposely keep the forest with the coffee. They can shift to other plantation or other commercial or whatever they need. But they, they know with in, uh, from indigenous knowledge they used to have or they get from their forefathers. Just I want to keep note. And maybe. Yes, this one. Uh, but just this is an example of what we do uh, to promote this. So this is more the commercial <laughs> part. Of the so we, we started a brand like three years ago in order to to promote this this kind of uh, production, to talk about the what kind of tree do you find do you find in the plot, um, to give more detail about the the farm, and if you want to come back to the previous slide, uh, this is some books we use to prepare this, so uh, you can find most of it all online except this one, but this guy is uh, I think is Norwegian, so you can probably find here. <laughs> And the other one you will find online. And you have many articles about uh, uh, canopy management, about uh, uh, chemical composition of the soil, about use of the trees, the second use. So, And most of it is online. This thesis is very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think we are done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, the cupping is not all prepared, so we might as well take some questions now. Um, uh, I, I was thinking because maybe I misunderstood, but is are you saying that because you obviously have a big respect for the farmers and they, their way of producing things, and but I, usually when, when I talk to other roasters and importers about the production, the yield in Ethiopia, I hear like, well, if they were pruning better or if they were doing this better, they could increase the yield a lot. Oh, but why? Exactly. That's the first question, why? We have uh, overproducing uh, in the world for the last two, three years, so why your small holders will, incre will increase his yield? First question. Second, how sure we are about the data we have? Um, we, we, they work in polyculture, as I, 
like uh, as I told you, so on the plot you have NZ, coffee, avocado, whatever. So uh, I'm sure the scientific uh, they will modelize this and they will reduce the impact of the polyculture. But and the th three, they they don't have high yield because it is because of some choice they do. It's um, as I told before, it's not only because they don't because some simply because they cannot afford to spend. Uh, their time or their money on the but coffee plot. But speaking of uh, about sustainability, doesn't that mean that, okay, so we can keep the yields low or they can keep them low of any choice, but then maybe we have to pay more for that, exactly. for that coffee. I think so this is the, the, the better, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the, the key is we need to, to increase the value of these coffees. We don't have to push them to change the model because as, as we try to show, it's I think it's very... It's a good model, it's very eco-friendly and everything. But, but so can you, I mean, because when I've been in, and when we go to Ethiopia, uh, we we uh, usually ask, when we come to a washing station, we ask, so how much do you pay the, yeah. uh, you know, for the... Yeah, for the cherries. Uh, yeah. Cherries. And that's usually based on a uh, demand on the coffee. How many washing stations around in that yeah. area are willing to pay 20 or 15 bir or whatever? So, and that has <coughs> nothing to do with the quality or, um, uh, or? Uh, depend of some, depend of the places. Some, uh, we work, for example, with people in um, Ambella and Gedeb, Metad, who pay a premium price for the red cherries. <laughs> so they have their own farm, but they also collect. And when a farmer delivers a, a kilo of cherries, they will, uh, they will pay a bonus if the, if the picking is good. So, uh, they the they the daily price for the cherries in Ethiopia. They they talk in the radio. They announce it. There is also some tricky games between the collectors. They agree on price. It could be also based on the politics. Mm -hmm. When they want to punish a place, they will smash down the price. When they want to this year it's an election year, so they will probably push up the price. And so it's not only about the business. It's also about. Uh, and but and but I, I, some people, yeah. they pay a, a premium for the red cherries, yeah. I think that's a really inter interesting perspective to uh, have been thrown into these, uh, the different discussions we have had these days.